This is Talk to Seattle. I am your host, Jason Rigdon. On this episode, I have Isabel Kerner. She's running for Seattle City Council in the 7th District. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, Jason? Doing pretty good. So could you tell me a little bit about yourself, maybe your background and experience? Yes, and thank you so much for having me on your show. So I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. I graduated from Garfield High School, and during that time, I took advantage of Seattle's Running Start program, which allowed me to earn my associate's degree and my high school diploma at the same time during my junior and senior year at Garfield. By participating in the Running Start program, I saved approximately $120,000 on higher higher education and graduated from American University in Washington, D.C. with a bachelor's degree in political science and a minor in studio art at age 20. During my time in D.C., I also interned for current Washington State Senator Maria Cantwell. And while interning for Senator Cantwell, I worked on several important policies, including but not limited to the Washington State Apprenticeship Program, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and intellectual property reform. So you've got a little bit of an experience in this like political sphere. Yes, I uh, was a political science major, and um, I learned a lot while interning for the center. Um, I also worked at Four Seasons in Georgetown while I was in college. So um, there was quite a few politicians, lobbyists, you know, people you see on the news all the time that came in. So got a little bit of a understanding of how some of the some of the deals are a little backhanded than you might expect. So what made you decide to run for this office in particular? Well, aside from the fact that it's much faster than walking, I decided to run for city council because I basically see problems everywhere. Since I uh, left Seattle to go to college, I, the number of homeless individuals that's living on the street has increased exponentially. We've seen increases in property crime in nearly every Seattle neighborhood. And it appears to me that the current city administration lacks the ability to effectively communicate with every department inside of it and is unable to come up with creative and innovative solutions that address the root cause of Seattle's most pressing problems instead of just treating the symptoms. So basically, I'm running for city council because I know that I can fix these problems in the most efficient and cost-effective way possible by ensuring that every single interest is taken into account so I can devise solutions that are basically a win-win for everybody that's affected by any policy changes and by Seattle's obvious shift in its socioeconomic and political climate. So can you tell me a little bit about your district? Uh, It's quite an interesting district. Um, It's Pioneer Square, Belltown, Downtown, Queen Anne, and Magnolia. So it is basically comprised of some of the highest income earners, as well as the ones who are living in tents and have virtually no income. Uh, We also have a large number of uh, apartment units and condos around here. So It's not your traditional neighborhood where you can go knocking door to door, aside from Queen Anne and Magnolia. And um, it's it's a tough crowd, I won't lie. Um, I've spoken to a lot of the homeless individuals, just going down there and talking to them. And you'd be very surprised how many of them have college degrees, some of them have backgrounds in construction. Uh, A lot of them are addicted to drugs, but they don't want to be. They'd like to turn their life around. Um, they have a huge problem amongst themselves with uh, having to worry about people literally stealing the shirt off their back while they're sleeping. And so I think that the issue needs to be uh, kind of addressed in a multifold approach in a very quick and effective way before it becomes so out of control that there's no possible way to really resolve it. So what are some of the biggest issues facing your district in particular? I would say that the biggest issues that we're facing right now are homelessness, which is intrinsically connected to increases in property crime. Uh, I would say we're also experiencing, particularly in Queen Anne and Magnolia, problems with our infrastructure and traffic especially. Ever since they closed the battery tunnels, there's basically one way to get 
from the north end to downtown, and that's through Denny. And if you've ever been driving down Denny, you know that you can sit in your car for half an hour and only get a few blocks. Um, we also have some bike lanes that aren't very uh, obvious, obviously bike lanes, I would say. They don't have a barricade. They just have a little bike symbol. It's pretty confusing as a driver to tell whether or not it's a, it's a car or bike lane or if it's just a bike lane because it's just got a little painted bicycle on it and some of them are partially washed off. So um, I think that's a big issue for a lot of people. And the Magnolia Bridge is about to fall down. I was down there the other day. Um, it kind of reminds me of a, it's kind of like they put a Band-Aid around a bunch of pieces of it. And um, they just closed the battery tunnels because apparently those weren't earthquake safe. But if you look at that bridge, it's been it's been around for 80 years. So it's it's kind of like we're just waiting for it to fall down. I also think another big issue is obviously that uh, it's becoming very expensive in that area for people to live, and that's obviously a separate issue regarding housing affordability. Um, And I would say that the other issue that we are dealing with is uh, we're not very prepared at all for any sort of natural disaster or an earthquake, which is basically inevitable. We just don't know when it's going to happen and how bad it's going to be if it is. But um, from the research I've done, we are not really prepared, nor do we have a plan to uh, assist anybody if something like that were to happen. And what do you think are some of the biggest issues facing the city as a whole? I think the biggest issues facing the city as a whole are, for one, homelessness, because I think that that is completely uh, connected to the increases in property crime and the increases in drug addiction. I'm not a supporter of safe injection sites just because of the basic laws with supply and demand. If you support the demand, you're also supporting the suppliers. And um, I think that from my experience in talking to these individuals, they don't want to be on drugs. It's just so hard for them to get off of them once they start, and a lot of people uh, fall through the cracks, and they become homeless. They get evicted or miss a payment. They have student loans, anything. And if they don't have a fallback, if they don't have anybody that lives around here, if they don't have any family to fall back on, there's basically nowhere that they can go. And if you are homeless or become homeless, you have to make friends to survive on the streets. And you might have never done heroin or any other drug in your life, but your homeless friend might have done heroin or any other drug. And, you know, it gets cold and they'll they'll say, well, just try heroin, you know. You'll be a lot warmer. And so then they kind of commingle with each other and it further exacerbates the problem. And while we do have shelters, I've heard so many stories about such bad things happening in those shelters that people become traumatized to the point where they don't trust the system anymore. And uh, the city is basically, the the affordable housing crisis, it's it's a little bit, it's a great name. I'll, I'll say that. But I don't, it's not like we have a housing shortage here. I mean, I walk around everywhere and all I see is vacancies for lease. I used to live in a building in Fifth and Mercer and Uh, They provided like a two-month free rent if you sign a one-year lease. And that basically dropped the rent to about $800 or $900 for a six to 750-square-foot unit with a dishwasher, a garbage disposal, a microwave right across the street from QFC. And it was vacant almost half the time that I lived there. So I think the problem is more that... um, We've been, in my opinion, short-selling every last bit of our public land to developers, not on the guarantee that we're going to be able to buy it back at a cheaper price in the future, but based on the guarantee that every time we build one of these uh, enormous, luxurious, uh, you know what I'm, but you know the buildings I'm talking about, the really big ones that just go up literally the second that the area is upzoned. And they don't have to pay taxes for about 12 years. They get a 30 to 70% property tax credit for making a portion of those units 
quote unquote affordable. Affordable basically being fourteen hundred dollars for studio or one bedroom apartment that's quite small compared to older buildings that have been around for quite a while. And when you do that, what you also do is you raise the value of all of the surrounding land. So every house, every old apartment building, every building owner is forced to deal with the increase in the property taxes once the land value is raised since it's a portion of the appraised value. And that burden then gets shifted down to the renters in the form of rent increases. And the renters don't seem to understand that it's more of a systematic problem. It's not just like they're the, the owners of the building are just trying to, you know, they're just trying to get by right now. I've talked to a lot of them too, and um, it's really difficult for them because there's also a, a huge tenants association, which is fair because you don't want to go evicting people, but it's also very, very costly to evict people. I think the average cost is about $9,000 per individual. So if you have to evict somebody and you've got to pay $9,000 to do that, that's also going to hit all the other renters in the form of property increases. Otherwise, the building is is not going to stay afloat, the older buildings or the homes. I know plenty of people who've sold their homes and just on the sole reason that their property taxes have basically tripled in the last few years because of all the development that's happened and they don't get a tax credit. Just the, just the developers that make a few of their units affordable and we're now finding out that there's not much oversight over whether they're really adhering to that. It's almost like it's a suggestion and not exactly a requirement. And what can the city do to help homeless folks? Oh, this is my favorite question. So I've devised a bit of a solution and I've talked to I've talked to as many I've talked to uh, as many companies, and I've talked to the homeless people. I've talked to the shelters about it, and I think it is a really feasible idea. There's about 23 parcels that I've identified of vacant or underutilized city-owned land, and they don't have to be very big, big areas of city-owned land. And basically what I think we should do is deploy shipping containers. Uh, there's a few companies. They're not companies that you'd normally hear about because they're just small manufacturing companies, you know, located in Kent or Tacoma, around there. And you could basically deploy these shipping containers. They already come partially remodeled, inflated with electricity and plumbing, kind of stack them like a U-shape, kind of like in a U-shape, you know, maybe three on each end and then maybe one in the middle or two in the middle for bathrooms and shower rooms. And um, you wouldn't have them all in one place. They'd be kind of scattered across the city depending on what it, what needs people have. And they wouldn't be permanent. We wouldn't just be giving them free housing and basically be like a three- to six-month program. And at the same time, you would offer them an opportunity to earn money by basically creating a Seattle public bank, basically kind of like a flexible spending card where you can earn money by cleaning up the mess that homelessness has created. So instead of, you know, safe injection sites, like you get a dollar for every needle that you turn in. And it goes into a bank account that's kind of like a savings account or like a retirement fund, but not a retirement fund. It's basically a fund to get you housing. And then you'd also work with um, manufacturing companies, tech companies, any sort of company that's struggling to meet the demand they have for skilled workers, and we also have an apprenticeship program here in Washington State that does provide a massive tax credit to companies that basically train individuals in areas that we are lacking and pair them with jobs, and it wouldn't be like assigning, like, here's here's your assigned job. It'd be like, what are your interests? What are you passionate about? What are you good at? And some of them like construction. Some of them don't want to do that type of work. Some of them know how to hack computers. They probably make great data analysts. You know, They're not dumb people. And I think that when you put all those pieces together uh, and you have like you know one set of these areas where if you have a family that's just falling through the cracks, you know, they get a whole container. It's 40 by 8 by 8 feet. So you know, three to six months, you don't have to worry about the cost of rent. You just you, you can save some money, 
get paired up with a job, you have access to mental health and addiction resources for those who need it, right on site. You probably only need about two people per site. And you'd have to follow certain rules and you'd have to want to change your life. But I think it would be more of a herd effect because in, I've, I've noticed that in every one of these uh, homeless encampments, there's basically kind of like leaders, you know. There's like people who kind of, uh, they operate in little factions in, within that group. And so if you can get these leaders to participate or enough people, you know, the demand for these drugs is going to go down, which means the suppliers of these drugs are going to be out of business. And the more people you get into these programs, and if it works, it will follow. And if it works well enough, it's the type of example that Seattle could set that could potentially change the entire country and the way the entire country handles homelessness because these containers are incredibly cheap. They're $2,000, $2,500, especially when purchased in bulk. There's a company just located over 1,000 of them on stock in Japan. They build shipping models out of them. And the other part is they're completely movable, stackable, earthquake-proof, Weatherproof, they're designed to withstand all sorts of, you know, weather conditions. And they're kind of like Legos. You can do whatever you want with them. And I just think it's so much more cost effective because if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If you fail, you fail. But at least you tried, you did it. And I really don't think it would fail. I think it would be pretty successful. And the city already has the land. I think the whole project based on my own cost estimates, would cost uh, no more than $25 million to get basically all 12,000 people off of the streets within six to eight months. And what can the city do to help the transportation system around here? Well, the transportation system is a bit of a disaster at the moment. And a lot of people probably won't like what I have to say about this because I know that a lot of people use buses. But there's been this explosion of bus lanes. And I understand that in certain times of the day, you know, buses, buses are needed. But I've also, I also, I, I rent a home, but I also drive. And the buses don't always stay in their lane. And when you take away an entire lane, you basically squeeze everybody else into another lane. And in Seattle here, we're supposed to think of ourselves as this green city that cares a lot about the environment, and it's just kind of mind-boggling to me, even with carpool lanes, because when you squeeze people into traffic, they just sit there idling for hours in traffic, and we raised our minimum wage to $15, so we are the highest paying city to work in, so people are willing to commute, and if you go around the city and just ask people who work, you know, at the bottom of the city, like the janitors, you know, the security guards, the people, the receptionists, none of them can afford to live in Seattle. So they have to spend time commuting. And so when you look at those dots and connect the fact that we raised our minimum wage, you know, everything became less and less affordable. People had to sell their houses, move outside the city, and they have no other option but to commute. And our transit system is not very cheap. It's pretty expensive. I mean, $2.75 for a bus ticket, and you only get a two-hour transfer. It's over $5 a day for just taking the bus, and you might spend hours. So if you include your time value at minimum wage, you know, you're paying a lot of money just to commute to Seattle. Whereas if people could afford to live here, they wouldn't have to commute, and we wouldn't have as much of a traffic problem. The second part of that is I think, um, I think this, this, streetcar, this streetcar plan, I, I just, I can't wrap my mind around it. I was reading the Belltown Historical Context, which kind of talks a lot about how we adapted to um, the growth of Seattle when the Alaskan Gold Rush happened. And back in the 19, uh, 1950s or so, we got rid of the streetcars because we realized that in order to accommodate the automobile, we needed to get rid of the streetcars. So the fact that we're going back to streetcars People aren't going to stop driving. I think the snowstorm proved that, given that, um, you know, there was cars crashing everywhere. 
um, people are still going to drive. And there are certain uh, free market incentive companies like Lyft and Uber that have used carpooling to already change the game. So I think that the city could be, and the traffic lights aren't timed. If you go down Mercer, it's like just red light, green light, red light, green light. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then we could definitely invest a lot more in some newer technologies, I think, for transportation, uh, potentially air transportation. I don't know why we can't be a little bit more creative in the scope of our thinking. You know, buses could fly, potentially. Um, I know that's a long shot, but it's not impossible. Um, especially with all of the advances in aviation that we've had over the last 10 years. And what can the city do to help improve housing affordability? Well, when it comes to housing affordability, like I mentioned before, I think there's a number of variables that need to be taken into consideration. For one, I would argue that there isn't a housing shortage. There's four lease signs everywhere. There's vacancies everywhere. The problem is, is that the housing is not affordable enough. And the reason it isn't affordable enough is because we have basically given all of these developers the green light to build whatever they want and pay no property taxes on it. Meanwhile, if you put a point down where that building is built and drew a circle around it, everything in that circle is going to raise in value. And their property taxes are going to skyrocket. And I, I, it started a while back when I was at Garfield, you know, it doesn't look anything like it used to. Those buildings went up in less than a year. I used to live in Lower Queen Anne. The second the area got upzoned, they literally knocked the building down the next day. And it comes with a bunch of no parking signs, those temporary easel ones. Some of them have permits, some of them don't. There's not much communication amongst the city departments and uh, how, how to enforce these things, and it's pretty unfair that they're going around taking away people's parking, ticketing them, towing their cars, and it really disproportionately affects poor people. And the other thing, it's not just housing affordability, but it's also just affordability in general. Um, everything here has become so expensive, and nobody knows where the money is going because it's all public record until they shell it over to the private companies who then determine where all the money is going, and those records are sealed. So now we've got a sugar tax, we have property tax, and we have sales tax. And we get our property, property taxes from, like I've already mentioned, uh, increasing the value of land. We get our sales tax by uh, a lot of tourism. I think that's a pretty... Uh, not obvious, but it is a factor in why they haven't replaced the Magnolia Bridge because Expedia is going to come in and develop all of Inner Bay. And, you know, Fort Lawton, that's just the start of it all, I think. Uh, and basically, to in improve housing affordability, I, I think the city needs to uh, use the last bit of public land they have left and not pass it over to people that are not only not from Washington, but some of them aren't even from this country. They're just investors that are investing in these buildings, and they can sit vacant for months, and they're still not losing money on them because they don't have to pay any property taxes. So I would, I would, I would argue that they could, uh, if one building that's going to be developed is getting a property tax credit, every single building in that area should get that same property tax credit. So we live in very polarized times. How would you, as a leader, help bring people together in the city? We do live in very polarized times, but I think it's very easy to be for or against a policy. However, I think it is much harder to be against an idea unless you have a better one. So that is how I plan to bring people together, by creating ideas that are so good and so innovative and works so well that you really can't argue too much against them. Especially, I mean, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of craftsmanship between a great idea and a great project, and it never turns out exactly the same. There's certain things you can't make concrete do. There's certain things you can't make plastic do, and it's never going to turn out like you expect it to, especially given that time is 
never on your side. So if you have a great idea in 2005 and and that idea isn't going to be up and running until 2015, then, then the, the landscape and the, the climate that you're creating this idea is has already changed. So you have to be willing to uh, adjust your ideas and adapt to the surrounding circumstances in order to really make that idea happen. And I think that there's always somebody that has to really be the visionary and keep the vision in mind and drive it because it's, it's a lot of work. You have, to, you have to keep a million pieces in your head at the same time and fit them together. And it seems like it's impossible, like it's a really long way. But as long as you have someone saying, well, we're one step closer. It's not just, it's not just some, you know, far out thing. We're, we're getting closer. And that's how I plan to bring people together, by not focusing on policies as much as focusing on solutions and ideas that will fix the problems because policies, they're just only effective to the point where they match the norms of society. So you can create any policy you want, but if, if, it, if it doesn't match what everybody else wants, they're not going to follow the policy and it's not going to be effective. And I think that those are the three most important things that you, that you have to think about when you create any policy is efficiency, cost effectiveness, and feasibility. And if people want to find more information about your campaign, where should they go? Well, you can go to kernerforcouncil.com. And uh, there will be several more ideas aside from the shipping container coming very soon. One of them will involve... Uh, reforming our trash and recycling system, and the other one will involve a new plan to renew the Magnolia Bridge and potentially a method of construction that could be used to very cost-effectively enhance any structure to make it compatible with current earthquake and other natural disaster standards. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jason. It was a pleasure speaking with you. This has been Talk to Seattle, and I've been your host, Jason Rigdon. If you want to support the show, please go to talktoseattle.com slash support.